He is an actor, producer, Oscar winner, and the owner of the hearts of millions of fans around the world. It's hard not to remember his roles. His character has become iconic. His romances have been talked about for decades. Welcome to the Biographer Channel. Today we are talking about Brad Pitt and what kind of person is hiding behind the mask of a carefree handsome. Which of his iconic roles does he hate? Why did his marriage to Angelina Jolie break up? And what helped the actor in the fight against alcohol and illegal substances? The most interesting facts and celebrity interviews are already waiting for you. Let's get started. William Bradley Pitt was born in Oklahoma on December 18, 1963 and grew up in Missouri. His father worked in a trucking company and his mother was a school counselor. In addition to Brad, there were two other children in the family, brother Douglas and sister Julie. As members of the Baptist church, Brad's parents raised their children in austerity. The family went to church every Sunday and the meal was only after praying. Parents forced the children to sing in a church choir. In an interview, the actor admitted that his father was incredibly cruel to him. According to Pitt, he grew up in a family where there were constant restrictions, prohibitions, and misunderstandings. It was because of his father's cruelty that he eventually stopped believing in God. I've gone through everything. Like, I cling to religion. I grew up with Christianity. Always questioned it, but it worked at times. And then, when I got out on my own, I completely left it and I called myself agnostic. However, the strict rules in the family did not prevent Pitt from growing up as a versatile child and trying himself in different areas. In high school, Bradley was a member of the school's golf, tennis, and swimming teams, but his main hobby was acting on stage. He had classes at the theater, which he still sponsors. After graduating from high school, the young man began to study journalism and advertising at the University of Missouri, Columbia. But two weeks before graduation, he dropped everything and without a degree, went to Hollywood. There, he changed his name to Brad Pitt. I always liked film as a teaching tool, a way of getting exposed to ideas that had never been presented to me. It just wasn't on the list of career options where I grew up. Acting success did not come to him immediately. Pitt took any job to feed himself and pay for expensive acting classes. He worked as a furniture transporter, and at night, he delivered strippers to parties in a limousine. He was even a barker at the El Pollo Loco restaurant chain. He walked the streets dressed as a giant chicken, inviting passersby to visit their establishment. It is interesting that work with strippers was not easy in moral terms, but in some sense helped Brad in his future acting career. The fact is that one of the girls took up Roy London's acting class. Pitt decided to go to the class too, and the knowledge that he got there was really useful to him later. Strippers changed my life. Yeah. <laughs> In parallel, he went to all kinds of auditions. One day, an agent noticed him and decided to take the young talent under his wing. Thanks to him, Pitt began to earn extra money on the set. For example, he was just standing in the doorway or portrayed a waiter in the film with Charlie Sheen. To get noticed and receive the coveted Actors Guild card, he tried to speak during his short appearances. I was an extra in a Charlie Sheen movie and I was a waiter and they were all, it was No Man's Land, D.B. Sweeney, and they were all sitting around a big table scene and I come up with the bottle and I was supposed to pour champagne and I come around and I think, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. I'm going to try to get a line in. I'm going to try. I'm going to try. Because they're all having a conversation. Mm -hmm. I figure maybe I can slip this in. Mm -hmm. And I pour this young actress a, a, uh, a glass of champagne. And I go, would you like anything else? And she looked at me and goes, <laughs> and the director goes, cut, cut. And the first oh, no. AD goes, you do that again, you're off the oh, set. And I go, oh, no. Oh, no. Among the first of Pitt's work is the famous Pringles Chips commercial broadcast on TV in 1989. Who knew that this tanned, handsome blonde would become a cinema legend in the future? Oh, no Pringles. Two years later, Pitt finally started getting cameo roles. For example, he got the role in several episodes of the TV series Another World and in everyone's favorite, Dallas. Hi, Randy. Hi, Marnie. Hi, Charlie. You look great, Charlie. Thanks. 
That was followed by roles in Growing Pains, Tales from the Crypt, as well as in the well-known 21 Jump Street, where Johnny Depp began his career. The first major movie role of Brad Pitt was a guy whose illness did not allow him to appear in the sun without protective dark clothes. The film The Dark Side of the Sun was shot in Yugoslavia in the late 80s. Due to the Civil War, part of the film footage was lost for 10 years and the movie was released only in 1997. Yes, sick and tired of this farce. After the first bad experience, the young actor made his way to the cinema as best he could. He first appeared alongside Patrick Dempsey in the comedy Happy Together and then in the horror film Cutting Class, where he played the school basketball star. Let's go to your house, huh? Why? Well, your father's still hunting. We can be alone. For this role, Brad Pitt received his first serious fee, $12,000. In the 90s, Pitt returned to television again to play more serious roles. The actor appears in the TV movie Too Young to Die with Juliette Lewis. His character, Billy, is a drug addict who takes advantage of the defenselessness of young Amanda and makes her an accomplice in a crime. So where you been all night, my love? You do not own me. The hell I don't. I don't owe you nothing else, all right? I care about you. Just... During filming, Pitt and Lewis had a whirlwind romance which, alas, did not stand the test of popularity. Juliet remained a promising actress, while Brad moved to a higher level. The handsome man got tired of constant scenes of jealousy, and he left Lewis after three years of marriage, having an affair with Gwyneth Paltrow. Juliet took the break too close to her heart and even tried to commit suicide. Meanwhile, Pitt's career continued to go up. He appeared in six episodes of Glory Days Canvas, the HBO television movie and the movie Across the Track. Summing up the TV roles, Pitt is filming a Levi's commercial. 1991 became a real breakthrough for the young actor. Then came the crime drama Ridley Scott's Thelma and Louise, in which Pitt played the role of the Conqueror of Hearts, J.D. Well, I may be an outlaw, darling, but... Uh... You're the one stealing my heart. In the film, Pitt has three small episodes, including the famous sex scene with Gina Davis, which brought him fame as the sexiest partner of modern Hollywood. Shortly before that, Pitt starred in the comedy The Favor, but its premiere took place only in 1994 due to the bankruptcy of Orion Pictures. In the films Johnny Suede and Cool World released in a year, Brad played the main roles. However, the films were not well received by critics and did not differ in originality. I'm gonna tell you this once, because you gotta be smarter than you look. You're dealing with shit here that's way over your head. But the role of a fearless reporter in the drama A River Runs Through It by Robert Redford proved that he wasn't just a handsome guy in a cowboy hat, but a talented actor. They say Pitt was very displeased with the results of the first auditions. He was able to insist on being allowed to send a video with another scene. As a result, the second version convinced the director that the actor was really suitable for the role. He doesn't look fishing. He doesn't like Montana. Sure as hell doesn't like me. <laughs> well, maybe what he likes is somebody trying to help. Brad didn't fight so hard for a place in the movie for nothing. A River Runs Through It impressed critics and received a number of Oscar and Golden Globe nominations. And although Brad didn't receive awards, that film took him to a new level and drew the attention of directors to the young talent. In 1993, Pitt starred in a cameo role in Tony Scott's True Romance, written by Quentin Tarantino. His hero never gets up from a couch and constantly smokes weed. By the way, Pitt himself suggested making his character a junkie, always lying on a couch. You condescend me, man. Well, the next project took him to new heights. On November 11th, 1994, Interview with a Vampire, The Vampire Chronicles was released. Kirsten Dunst became famous. Tom Cruise proved that he was able to play the villain. Well, for Brad Pitt, shooting in one of the most important films in his career became a living hell. The actor later called the role a failure. That noise. 
It's driving me mad. That noise! We've been in the country for weeks with nothing but that noise. Yes, they know about us. They watch us dine on empty plates and drink from empty glasses. <sighs> First of all, it was physically hard. Pitt hung upside down every day to rush the blood to his head and to bring out a vein. He also wore a heavy wig and contact lenses that hurt his eyes. Like a real vampire, Pitt did not see the light. Almost all the shooting was carried out at night and then in the middle of winter in foggy Albion. Six months in the fucking dark, the actor complained. The fact that the author of the original book, Anne Rice, was categorically dissatisfied with the casting for the main roles made things worse. The fact is that she wrote the first version of the script herself, representing the perfectly beautiful Frenchman Elaine Delon, in the image of Louis. It is understandable why the writer was so outraged by the subsequent casting for the film. There was nothing in common between the star of intellectual European cinema and the hopelessly earth Brad Pitt, who advertised fried chicken yesterday. I'm frightened of myself. That, of course, demoralized Brad. If the actor had been inspired by the story itself, all of the above suffering would have paid off. And he did when he was preparing for the role. Pitt was familiar with the book and read the first version of the script, which he was quite satisfied with. But when Brad got the final script two weeks before the start of work, he realized that it would not be at all what he expected. Every day, he felt more and more disappointed in his role. In the book, this guy asked the question, who am I? At that time, it was very close for me. Am I a good person? Am I on the side of the angels? Am I bad? Am I on the side of a devil? In the book, he is in search. In the film, they made the central character of Lestat. Everything connected with it is very interesting and exciting, and I had nothing to do. I just had to sit and watch. Thus, the screenwriters gave the talented actor the background role, not allowing him to really open up. I'm not the spirit of any age. I'm at odds with everything. I always have been. Already in the midst of filming, he felt so depressed that he still tried to leave the project. He was stopped only by a forfeit of $40 million, which he would have to pay the studio back to break the contract. Unhappy, depressed, and missing the sun, Brad was tormented to the end. And I must say, in the film, the lack of enthusiasm for him is noticeable. I walked as I walked years before when my mind swam with guilt at Although the film received mixed reviews in the press, the audience loved it. However, the scene of Kirsten Dunst and Pitt kissing greatly outraged some viewers. It was then discussed for a long time in the media, and the actors later admitted that they felt very uncomfortable during the filming of that moment. In any case, unlike many one-day horror films, the movie made a real splash. The film has firmly entered the category of cinema classics, and it is now considered one of the best films about vampires. Even Anne Rice, after watching, changed her point of view and praised the film adaptation. Have you watched this movie? If so, be sure to write in the comments if you liked it. I read everything and like the best ones. In the same year, Edward Zwick's large-scale epic Legends of the Fall was released, where Sir Anthony Hopkins himself was Brad's partner. The film received numerous Academy Award nominations, including Best Sound and Best Costume Design and Brad finally got his first Golden Globe nomination. Mr. Finn Cannon, it's a pleasure to meet you. I hope you and Ugly here find every happiness together. As if wanting to distance himself as much as possible from the romantic role he got in past projects, in 1995, Brad Pitt played the mentally ill dreamer in Terry Gilliam's fantasy thriller 12 Monkeys. Since work on the film began even before the release of the hits that made Pitt an actor of the first magnitude, he was paid a rather modest $100,000 for that role. But in the end, the actor got something more valuable than money. Even Bruce Willis, who was already a star at that time, agreed to the minimum fee. It was all about the opportunity to work with an extraordinary director. Pitt visited the psychiatric department of Temple University for several weeks to play the mentally unstable Jeffrey Goins. The actor carefully rehearsed all the awkward, crazy movements of his character and selected a special timbre of his voice. In order for Pitt to be able to pronounce his lines correctly, quickly, and nervously, 
Terry Gilliam sent him to a tutor. But then he figured out just to limit the actor in smoking, and he, feeling stressed, played exactly as Gilliam wanted. The efforts of this duo were not in vain. For his role, Pitt received a Golden Globe and his first Oscar nomination for Best Supporting Actor. In the same 1995, the film Seven by David Fincher was released. For the filming in it, Brad refused a role in Apollo 13. There were some injuries on the set. During the filming of the chase scene, he slipped, hit his hand on the windshield, and got a ruptured tendon. Pitt had to wear a cast until the end of filming, and the production team had to urgently edit the script so that the character also got injured. As a result, in the scenes that were supposed to take place before the chase, but were filmed later, the actor had to hide his cast hand. Interestingly, studio executives were not satisfied with the ending of the film and asked Fincher to rewrite it. But Brad, who considered her the most suitable, rebelled and threatened to leave the film if the ending was changed. After its release, Pitt was included in the top 25 sexiest stars in the history of cinema, according to Empire Magazine. He was subsequently voted Sexiest Man Alive by People Magazine twice. Brad Pitt became the first and so far the only person to receive this honor twice. But Brad did not have time to enjoy the status of an enviable bachelor, because even during the filming of the movie Seven, he began an affair with Gwyneth Paltrow. The actors immediately became the audience's favorites, appeared everywhere together, and after a year of relationship, they got engaged. Hello, man. Later, Barry Levinson's legal drama Sleepers was released, where Pitt played the role of a lawyer who was sexually abused as a child. His co-stars on the set were Kevin Bacon, Dustin Hoffman, and Robert De Niro. In 1997, paparazzi photographed the actor naked while on vacation with Gwyneth Paltrow in Europe. Pitt sued the magazine and won it, but the whole world had already seen the provocative pictures by that time. In the same year, Brad and Gwyneth broke up. In addition to the wounded soul, Pitt suffered real injuries in that year. The actor spent some time in Northern Ireland preparing for a role in the film The Devil's Own. There, he was attacked and beaten. The most annoying thing is that the film was not worth those bruises at all. There were many problems and misunderstandings on the set. Work on the film was delayed, the script was rewritten several times. Pitt even decided to leave the project, considering the final version of the story incomplete and incoherent, but the producers threatened legal action and he had to stay. According to rumors, the situation was aggravated by his relationship with Harrison Ford. The actors were in conflict all the time on the set, and that despite the fact that Pitt personally suggested Ford for that role. As a result, the film was not particularly liked by the audience and received mixed reviews from critics. In the same year, the film Seven Years in Tibet was released. It described the story of the adventures of an Austrian climber in Tibet during the Second World War. The film was based on the autobiographical book of the same name by the Austrian climber and traveler Heinrich Harrer. Brad got a very complex and controversial character. And it's not even that the actor's accent in this film was named the third worst accent in Hollywood history, according to Empire Magazine. In the film, Heinrich Harrer had a negative attitude towards the Nazis, but before the premiere, there was information that his prototype was actually a member of the Nazi party and served in the SS. However, Harrer later stated that it was mistakes of youth, but an unpleasant feeling remained. Since the film implied a political context, among other things, Pitt was often asked about his position on that matter. Who cares what I think China should do about Tibet? I'm a f***ing actor. I'm a grown man who puts on makeup. When the film was released, the Chinese government denounced it, saying that Chinese communist officers were shown to be excessively rude and cruel to the people of Tibet. Because of that, Pitt, Thulis, and director Jean-Jacques Anad were given a lifetime ban from entering China. Despite all this, many viewers liked the film. And after a while, the ban was cancelled and Pitt visited China in 2014 and 2016. Following this film, Brad reappeared with Anthony Hopkins in Meet Joe Black, a remake of the 1934 film Death Takes a Holiday. The actor played Death that took over the body of a young man. Although the actors coped perfectly, the reviews for the film were mixed. 
The main reason for the critics' dissatisfaction was the three-hour duration of the film, which slowed down the pace of the narrative too much. At the same time, there were no special effects in the picture, and for some time, the film was the most expensive in the history of cinema, where special effects were not used. A two-hour version was made to show the film on television, but director Martin Brest ridiculed and disowned that one. Therefore, in the credits of the short version, the director's name was changed to the famous Hollywood pseudonym Alan Smithy, which is used in cinema for directors who want to disown the project. The film received several nominations for the most famous anti-awards in the world of cinema and show business in the nomination of the Worst Film of the Year and Worst Remake. Despite this, the film grossed a good box office. Although, according to some film critics, it is believed that this happened due to the fact that before the start of the picture, there was a trailer for Star Wars The Phantom Menace, and fans of the series bought tickets for Meet Joe Black, only because of an opportunity to watch the trailer for the new picture of the legendary saga. While working on the picture, Brad Pitt and his colleague on the set, Claire Forlani, had an affair, which, however, ended quickly enough. But in 1998, the press had a new reason for gossip. Brad started a relationship with Jennifer Aniston, whom he met on a blind date. Pitt was captivated by a carefree, laughing girl who seemed to have been created for him. Rumor has it he even took Greek lessons because Aniston is of Greek descent. It's funny that the actor played in the TV series Friends the role of a guy who hates Rachel, the heroine of Aniston. Rachel Green. Oh, oh, that's right. Are, are you going to be okay? Oh, I'll, I'll be fine. It's just... God, I hate her, Ross. I hate her. <laughs> but for now, let's go back to 1999, the year Tyler Durden appeared. Initially, the producers of Fight Club considered Russell Crowe for the role of the charismatic soap merchant, but then their choice fell on Pitt. Seeing him in action, no one regretted their decision. If I ever let us down, how far have you come because of me? Pitt did not want to act in Fight Club until Fincher, the director of the picture, himself appeared on his doorstep and over a couple of bottles of beer persuaded him to take on this role. Before filming began, Brad and his co-star Edward Norton had to prepare thoroughly. They seriously took up boxing to make the fight scenes look high quality, and they also attended soap making lessons. How could they go without it? At the same time, Norton and Pitt followed different diet and training regimens in order to show the contrast between the two characters. In an interview, Norton admitted that the goal was to make his character look weaker and weaker and Pitt's character stronger. Brad got bigger and stronger throughout the film, more muscular, tanned, and more handsome as I turned into Gollum. Unfortunately, this subtle visual metaphor is often overlooked by viewers because Pitt is so attractive that most actors will, in principle, look like Gollum in his background. In addition to training, for the sake of filming in the movie, Pitt specifically chipped his front teeth as he felt that it would be in keeping with the character of his hero. Many scenes in the film do not accidentally look too real. The fact is that in the scene where the narrator hit Tyler Durden in the ear for the first time, Norton had only to simulate a strong blow. But a few minutes before the shooting began, Fincher took Norton aside and told him to hit for real. So the grimace of pain on Pitt's face can hardly be called fake. Motherfucker. And in the scene where the narrator and Tyler were playing golf, they were actually drunk. It is clear that Pitt did not really want his parents to see this picture, but they insisted on their own. After watching the chemical burn scene, they really regretted their decision. We're models for God. If our fathers bailed, what does that tell you about God? No, 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 I don't. Listen to me. I have to consider the possibility that God does not like you, he never wanted you. In all probability, he hates you. This is not the worst thing that can happen. The movie failed miserably at the box office, not even paying for itself. Some of the bigwigs at the film company lost their jobs as a result. Only Brad Pitt remained in the black. His fee was $17.5 million, seven times more than Edward Norton. Despite the failure, just a few years after the premiere, the film was recognized as one of the most outstanding films of our time and rallied an army of ardent fans around it. 
It will not be superfluous to say that Fight Club is the rarest case when the adaptation of the story surpassed the literary source on all accounts. Even the author himself, Chuck Palahniuk, admitted this. It would seem that after making a film where they really hit you in the face, almost knock out a tooth and so on, Brad would have gotten tired of this genre. But the actor found out that director Guy Ritchie was working on a new film. Pitt, being a big fan of his previous work, especially Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels from 1998, wrote to the director and asked for the role. And Ritchie agreed. Brad Pitt entered the new millennium at the height of his career. And Guy Ritchie's movie Snatch once again confirmed the actor in the status of a superstar. It was a dream job for Brad. As the director told Esquire, he called me and told me that he wanted to be part of whatever I was doing next. Pitt elaborated on the story. At that time, I did something that I felt was very commercial and I was really interested to see what new directors were doing and what was coming out. So I was viewing everything of first-time directors and I saw this movie Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels by this cat named Guy Ritchie. And so I called him up and said, Hey, I really like what you're doing, and if there's anything that I can fit in, then let's talk. Understanding that he was ready for any role in the movie Snatch and having failed the exam for imitating the London manner of speech, Brad got one of his brightest roles. It was Mickey O'Neill. Brad had no problems with the accent of his unusual character. Oh, his speech is not particularly understandable. Rapid muttering became a kind of feature of his image. Nevertheless, Pitt worried so much about the accent right up until the start of filming. In an interview, he said he was taught to be intelligible, but how could he mumble unintelligibly? I went to Jim the day before and I said, Guy, I'm gonna fuck up your movie, he said. But Richie helped him overcome his fear. All this was a gamble. Even the actors should not have understood it. Do you like dogs? Dogs. What? Yeah, dogs. Dogs. Do you like dogs? Oh, dogs. Sure. The actor took classes from boxing coach Joe Goosen to prepare for the role. He praised Brad's efforts very much. Brad showed up to work every day of those five weeks. The sessions were at least two hours every time. He put himself through the grinder to get where he ended up. Between the filming of movies, Brad had to gain about 10 pounds of muscle, which is a decent number considering his physique. Although he did not like the fact that he would have to play a boxer again after his recent experience in the previous film. In addition, Brad almost didn't take a shower during filming. How else to play a sleazy Irish traveler who lived in a van? The movie was called Crazy and Brilliant. Good humor, fantastic characters, good written dialogue, professional directing, and camera work. The special way of presenting visual material using unusual angles of camera and tricks gave the film a special atmosphere. Pitt's efforts were highly appreciated, too. He was able to fit into a strange, non-normative role. The scenes of the actor's performance in the ring were especially vivid and memorable. Brad Pitt sheds his movie start personally and performs impressively as an Irish gypsy. This was the average verdict of viewers on IMDb. Still, in 2000, the actor participated in the American comedy franchise Jackass, although he got only a small episodic role there. He starred in two episodes of the show. In the episode Night Monkey, he put on a gorilla costume to go out on the streets of Los Angeles together with four other joking heroes and made a little mess. They ran around the city, jumped into bushes, drove around in carts, and crashed into each other on scooters. <laughs> Apparently, Pitt was ready to go on the show, Johnny Knoxville said on Hot Ones. We were all like, oh, we really don't want him to get hurt because he's Brad Pitt and he's, but he did not care. He, he was ready to do it. He was the first one in the middle of the street and we're like, no, 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 don't do that. But he didn't care. By this moment, Brad was already developing an affair with Jennifer Aniston. They started dating sometime in 1999, appearing together at the Emmy ceremony. Already in 2000, they announced their wedding. It was captivated by Aniston's carefulness and brightness. Jen is the woman of my life, Pitt proudly declared in every interview. The budget of the actor's wedding was estimated at about $1 million. The ceremony itself took place in Malibu, but you can hardly find photos on the internet. They say the location was decorated with 50,000 flowers and the fireworks cost the couple $20,000. The guests recalled the ceremony was simple and relaxed, 
and the young couple took vows in a playful way. It was under the influence of Jennifer that the actor acquired the secular gloss familiar to many and played his most successful commercial roles. And it was during this period that the actor looked in love in every interview. The Vanity Fair article where you were saying that maybe it's not, maybe two people, the nature of two people is not meant to be with each other forever. Well, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm not sure what I was talking about. Okay. <laughs> In 2001, a comedy thriller, The Mexican, by Gore Verbinski, with Brad in the title role, was released. He got the role of Jerry Welbeck, who by chance stays on a criminal path. Julia Roberts was his partner on the set. She played his hysterical girlfriend, Samantha. Brad perfectly coped with the comedic role of a clumsy criminal. Despite this, the film has a 54% rating on Rotten Tomatoes from 133 critics. The audience did not find a consensus. The movie was accused of being chaotic and incoherent. Roberts and Pitt, in general, are amazing actors, but they are terrible in the Mexican, they said. They worked all the kinks out of it like any Hollywood movie with Brad Pitt and Julia Roberts, but it's quirky and weird enough to stand out from the others, others decided. Some were surprised at how good it turned out to be, others how bad and delayed. No matter how sophisticated the critics were in their research, the movie earned $147.8 million, and it stayed in the first place at the box office in North America in the first week. After the Mexican's awkward charisma came the mysterious floor spy game, where Brad got the role of, well, of course, a spy named Tom Bishop. There, he tried on black aviators and got into the image we will all like later in the future. Repeat that. Throw out the bottle. They know. They don't know. They don't fucking know. They'll be waiting. Drop as close to checkpoint as possible. Negative, we're coming across. No, that's an order. The actor refused to participate in the equally famous picture, The Born Identity, the star in the film. Some scenes of the movie were supposed to be shot in Israel, but due to the escalation of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in 2000, filming had to be moved to Morocco. Tony Scott's thriller became a blockbuster hit, grossing $143 million worldwide and received mostly positive reviews from film critics. It was praised for playing flawlessly in partnership with Robert Redford. The consensus reads, The outcome of the kinetic spy game is never in doubt, but it is fun watching Robert Redford and Brad Pitt work. In parallel, Pitt did not miss the opportunity to star in the cult TV series Friends as an invited guest. Oh, oh, that's right. Are, are you going to be okay? Oh, I'll, I'll be fine. It's just... God, I hate her, Ross. I hate her. The third film in 2001 was... Well, maybe you can suddenly remember it, huh? Of course, we are talking about the famous Ocean's Eleven, a crime film by Steven Soderbergh. Eleven people got together to rob a casino. Brad was among them in the role of Robert Rusty Ryan. He is the right hand of the protagonist and his best friend. He is elegant and balanced, but at the same time, he is an avid gambler and sharper. This was how the world saw the new image of the actor. What, did you guys get a group rate or something? Each of the main actors went to reduce his fee in order for the picture to be released. George Clooney set the example by limiting his income. In an interview, he said, we said if we all get paid, we can't make the movie, so why don't we just take a big chunk of the back end, work cheap, and see if there's any money at the end. Las Vegas became a huge filming venue. One of the things that scared me when I read the script was the amount of time we would have to shoot at the casino, Soderbergh said. The team was lucky that one of the producers, Jerry Weintraub, and the owner of the Bellagio Casino were friends. It allowed them not to be limited to shooting only at night and feel free to close this or that part of this casino or turn off the fountains. By the way, if you noticed, Rusty has an interesting feature. Throughout the film, he constantly eats or drinks something. It was the actor's idea. Brad believed that with all the planning of a multi-million dollar casino robbery, there would simply be no time for hearty dinners, and his hero would have to eat fast food as soon as such an opportunity arises. This interesting feature had another side. In one of the scenes, the actor had to eat 40 shrimp while reshooting. In order to convey the friendly atmosphere between the main characters, the actors had to spend a lot of time together. Jerry Weintraub recalls, It wasn't hard to do because they all liked each other, and as soon as they started spending time together away from the set, real friendships developed. Can't buy that. 
When you have actors who can't wait to go to work and work with one another and be with each other, that's exciting. In all my years in show business, I don't think I've ever had as much fun as I've had on this movie. The film recouped the cost of time and effort and brought $450 million. The casino robbery adventure became so popular that the director decided to release two sequels, building a whole universe of cunning robbers and evil billionaires in the Mojave Desert. That's how Ocean's 12 appeared in 2004 and Ocean's 13 in 2007. For participating in three parts, Brad received a very good fee of $30 million. There was a lull in the actor's career for a while. In 2002, Brad appeared only in episodic roles. In the melodrama Full Frontal by Steven Soderbergh, he got a cameo role of himself. The movie demonstrated one day in the life of some Hollywood celebrities. Move! Move! Out of the way! God damn it. Uh, looks like we're late. Looks like. Back to square one. That's what he thinks. You think different? Like the back of my big 10 inch. Oh, come on. The idea was unsuccessful and defeated by film critics. In George Clooney's comedy drama called Confessions of a Dangerous Mind, he played the role of bachelor number one, you won't believe it, named Brad. In addition, in 2002, Brad Pitt started a new business. He founded his own production company called Plan B Entertainment, a joint venture with Jennifer Aniston and Brad Gray, the head of the Hollywood film studio Paramount Pictures. It was Pitt's company that produced such films as Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, starring Johnny Depp, and a few years later, not without Pitt's efforts, such films as A Mighty Heart with Angelina Jolie and The Assassination of Jesse James by the coward Robert Ford were released. Plan B Entertainment also participated in the creation of the film The Departed, which won an Oscar. In 2003, Pitt was engaged in the voice acting of Sinbad in the animated film Sinbad, Legend of the Seven Seas, and played a cameo role in Ryan Williams' dark comedy, Abby Singer. But the stagnation didn't last long, and next year, Brad got the opportunity to play Achilles in a historical drama called Troy. In order for the actor's body to look like the body of an ancient Greek hero, Pitt had to train for six months, working five days a week with a coach. Also, he began to practice sword and spear training. He tried so hard that, ironically, he injured his Achilles tendon, which caused the shooting to be postponed for some time. But this was not the only victim. During the filming, the actor quit smoking, changed his own schedule for the sake of training, and refused many culinary dishes, which was very difficult for him. Wolfgang Peterson approached the creation with scale. Just remember the views of a huge Greek flotilla and he clearly liked the image of Achilles performed by Pitt, considering how often the latter was on the screen. Well, why not? He came out a formidable, rebellious, but generally attractive Spartan, and the actor's performance was appreciated with dignity. The actor's training was so serious that in many scenes he refused to use an understudy. Brad Pitt and Eric Bana played the fight scene between Achilles and Hector themselves. Both actors diligently prepared for it, rehearsed, and even trained together in a gym. The actors concluded a gentleman's agreement among themselves to pay each other for each successful hit. $50 for a light hit and $100 for a serious one. As a result, Pitt paid Bana $750, but he did not receive a cent. The film was a great success, grossing $497 million. Brad received about $17.5 million for his role, which was quite good. The reviews were contradictory. The number of positive reviews from critics slightly exceeds the number of negative ones. Metacritic gave the film 5.6 points. Professional critics were not so generous. Jonathan Foreman from the New York Post wrote that the film Troy was spoiled by one of the worst castings in recent Hollywood history. The lackluster ensemble hired by the director was overwhelmed by impressive scenery and mass scenes. Roger Ebert, one of the most famous film critics, gave the film two stars out of four. The critic was dissatisfied with the lack of Greek gods, characters shown as typical action movie heroes, and computer-generated armies. The characters are not as complex and conflicted in the Greek drama as they were shown in the film.
A series of successful projects with Pitt's participation continued, and already in 2005, the film Mr. and Mrs. Smith was released. The story tells how the two main characters, John and Jane Smith, played by Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, are trying to build a family relationship. And everything would be fine if they weren't both killers. You still alive, baby? Jolie was not the first candidate for the role. Initially, Nicole Kidman was supposed to be Mrs. Smith but she eventually refused this opportunity because of her participation in the filming of The Stepford Wives. After Brad also left the project, the producers began sorting through the candidates. There was even an idea to invite Gwyneth Paltrow to create a special tension in the film. Doug Lyman admitted, But Brad is a human being. Even if he was game for it, it's wrong for us to put him in a situation where he's going to have to relive the demons of a relationship. Only after Jolie agreed to the role, Pitt returned to filming. Angelina mentioned that she had her own reason to agree to the role. In an interview with Vanity Fair, she explained that two unsuccessful previous marriages with actors Johnny Lee Miller and Billy Bob Thornton helped her get into the role. She said, It was a study of partnership, what's going wrong, and what we're struggling with. Finally, it's, can they work as a team, and are they covering for each other? By this point, both actors were popular stars. Therefore, the news about the joint project generated a huge interest from the press and an inextinguishable onslaught of paparazzi. According to the memoirs of producer Akiva Goldsman, paparazzi armies lined up along the highway. It was impossible to stop them. The problem became so serious that some members of the press inadvertently got into the film. As a result, they had to be cut from the final version. It got to the point that they promised $300,000 to the shooting group for a joint photo of actors. Then they were using a scanner to listen to our walkie-talkies, said the director. The filming process was interesting, largely due to the fact that both Pitt and Jolie were the force to be reckoned with. The director admitted that the personalities of the actors were the opposite of the images they played. She in the movie is playing the way Brad is in real life and vice versa. I mean, he really is a homemaker. He's into fabrics and art and architecture, and what color is on the wall? Is it eggshell or a crew? She had no point of reference at all from her own life of what a normal home would be like, and she's much more into weapons as a human being than Brad is. Anytime my prop guy did show and tells of knives and guns, she'd be very, very knowledgeable. Shooting competitions between the main actors added fuel to the fire. Both stars took lessons with weapons to look believable and the live ammunition that was used at the same time taught them to trust each other. Moreover, Jolie, like Pitt, preferred to perform tricks and difficult scenes on her own. The competition was not only in shooting, but also in combat scenes. In an interview, Angelina admitted that it was more difficult for Pitt to perform such scenes because it was not easy for him as a man to hit a woman. We wanted, you know, every time a husband and wife says to each other, I could just kill you, we thought, what if they really could? She recalled. Come to dad. By this point, Pitt had been married to Aniston for five years. After the end of Friends, Jennifer declared that she was ready to replenish the family, and the couple's fans discussed their wonderful marriage. In an interview with The Guardian, she said, It's about time. You know, I think you can work when you have a child. You can work pregnant. You can do anything. So I'm looking forward to slowing down. And after the filming was over, she planned to go on a trip with Brad. But the miracle did not happen. The big passion on the screen of Mr. and Mrs. Smith turned into a big passion off the set. Rumors began to circulate around Brangelina, which eventually turned out to be confirmed. Jolie recalled how her relationship with Pitt began. I didn't know much about Brad's personal life. I was quite happy to be a single mother. Suddenly, this strange friendship developed between us. A few months later, I realized that I couldn't wait to start working on the film. We just enjoyed everything we had to do together and became something of a couple. It wasn't until the end of filming that we realized that maybe our relationship was more than we thought. On January 7, 2005, Aniston and Pitt officially announced their separation, emphasizing that they remained friends. The actor commented on their divorce. I haven't lived an interesting life for myself. I think my marriage has something to do with it. 
This marriage pretended it was something it wasn't. Jolie and Brad's romance grew into a 10-year relationship and made a family with six children. Write your opinion in the comments. What couple do you consider cool? Is it a relationship with Jolie or Jennifer? And we continue. Mr. and Mrs. Smith became very popular and brought in $487 million. Although it had mixed reviews, the birth of Brangelina greatly overshadowed the film both during filming and at the box office. Everything was complicated by the fact that fans and viewers were more interested in the details of the personal life of the heroes than the movie itself. Since that time, there were almost no interviews held without provocative questions. Tell me what it was like uh, the first time that you uh, laid eyes on Angelina. Was it like one of those classical love stories, like when, I don't know, when Ross first saw Rachel? You know that show, Friends? Have you seen that? The next was another big work by Brad Pitt, Babel, the movie of Alejandro G. Inaritu. There, the actor was able to demonstrate his potential as a dramatic actor. And for its sake, Brad turned down the role in The Departed as he was a fan of the director's work. A complex plotline, a lot of characters that are intricately intertwined with the genius of Inaritu reveal the human essence and cultural conflicts that everyone faces. His character is simple and complex at the same time. He is either a rude American or a caring husband. This time, you won't see a cute face with a mysterious smile. Pitt is serious, frowning, and he's on the edge, but it's worth watching him in this image. Really? I held him in my hand. It really didn't Are you okay? No, I'm okay. Another unusual role in the actor's piggy bank is the image of the legendary raider and robber of the Wild West, Jesse James. His life was illustrated in Andrew Dominic's biographical western, The Assassination of Jesse James by the Coward Robert Ford. The director was able to show us another non-typical side of Brad, gloomy, mournful, compassionate, and kind at the same time. Here, we see Pitt in the role of a daring, unpredictable sadist who kills not only out of necessity, but also for his own pleasure. Gradually, his character falls into paranoia, seeing betrayal in close friends and associates. Well, you're giving me signs that grieve my soul. It make me wonder. Maybe your mind's been changed about me. A deep work that conveys a deep and contradictory human experience to the viewer. In that period, we see the desire of the actor to invest his time in serious, meaningful stories. In 2019, Pitt told the New York Times, In the 90s, I did become aware that there was this kind of leading man role that you could plug any of us into and it didn't even matter. We would all have the same result. For his role, the actor was awarded the Volpe Cup for Best Actor. In 2008, the film was awarded two Oscar nominations, a Golden Globe nomination, and many others. In 2008, it performed one of his most high-profile roles in the film The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. The film was the actor's third work with director David Fincher and was based on the short story of the same name by Francis Scott Fitzgerald. The role radically differs from the previous ones. It's energetic and revolutionary in style, visual presentation, and tone. Gradually, it involves us in the plot and asks such simple and such important questions, the transience of life and the importance of its moments. The love thread played by Pitt and Kate Blanchett is also important. Sleep with me. Absolutely. The actor's desire to choose roles, not just for the sake of roles, can be seen. Brad tried to be critical of the role selection in order to prove his talent and choose interesting projects. However, such projects required a lot. To make everything look as natural as possible, Pitt was for about five hours every day under the power of the makeup artists. Despite the non-standard main role, the actor coped with it perfectly, plausibly playing his hero both at 16 and 60, adding his own charisma to the image, which makes Button a pleasant character. You may not have noticed, but there was an Easter egg for another famous work of the duo in the drama. We're talking about Fight Club. In one of the scenes, Benjamin's father asks about the house on Paper Street where Tyler Durden lived. The Curious Case of Benjamin Button received a lot of rave reviews from viewers and critics. 
The director's work, Brad's game, sound, and visual effects were highly appreciated. The film got $335.8 million and was nominated in 13 Academy Award categories. Among them was Best Actor for Brad Pitt. It did get three of them, and the film is considered one of David Fincher's best works. Another movie of the year was the black comedy of the Coen brothers, Burn After Reading. There, Pitt, together with George Clooney, Francis McDormand, and John Malkovich, played the main roles. Chad Feldheimer is an eccentric fitness trainer who finds himself embroiled in a mess around a mysterious disc with supposedly secret CIA data. He finds himself in quite funny and difficult situations, trying to make money on a successful find. I thought you might be worried. Worried? About the security of your shit. Brad coped well with the role of an eccentric and comical character, but it was exactly what we expected from him in a comedic role. It once again established himself as an actor who can handle a variety of types of images and characters. Burn After Reading was received mostly positively. Andrew Pulver, The Guardian's film reviewer, awarded the film four stars out of five, calling it a highly twisted spy comedy with a brilliant plot. The film received two Golden Globe nominations and three BAFTA nominations, among them for Best Supporting Actor for Brad Pitt Participation. The actor turned out to have an equally impressive image in the action-adventure in Glorious Bastards by Quentin Tarantino, which was revealed to the eyes of viewers in 2009. A ruthless Nazi hunter named Aldo the Apache is brutal, cruel, and a charismatic character. Another one up there you might be familiar with. Sergeant Hugo Stiglitz. Heard of him? Everybody in the German Army's heard of Hugo Stiglitz. Pitt hesitated to take on this role because of Harvey Weinstein's association with the film and the outrage of the film itself. But Tarantino convinced him. He was helped by a night of conversations about the role in the Maryville Castle, where Brad lived with Angelina and a bottle of Pink Floyd pink wine. Pitt told, All I know is we talked about backstory and we talked about movies into the wee hours. I got up the next morning and I saw five empty bottles of wine on the floor. Five and something that resembled a smoking apparatus. I don't know what that was. Apparently, I had agreed to do the movie, and six weeks later, I was in a uniform. Quentin spent about 10 years writing the script and admitted in an interview that he did not fully understand how this story would end. He explained to Rotten Tomatoes, When you start writing, you have your characters on a metaphorical paved road, and as they go down it, all these other roads become available that they can go down. I've never put any roadblocks on any of these paths. My characters can go wherever they would naturally go, and I'll follow them. Pitt liked this character so much that he stayed in character most of the day, Tarantino recalled. It wasn't some methody, psychotic kind of thing, or some unnerving kind of thing. He could always respond as Brad, but there was always a little Aldo in there. He was pleased with how Pitt understood his character and intuitively played it right. And the German will be sickened by us. And the German will talk about us and the German will fear us. The alternate history of World War II received many positive reviews, as well as eight Oscar nominations, including for Best Film, Best Director, and Best Original Screenplay. The movie got $321 million and pleased all fans of both Tarantino and Brad. The actor also had the pleasure of cartoon voiceovers. In 2010, Metro Man from Megamind spoke Brad's voice, and in 2011, he voiced Will the Krill in Happy Feet 2. By this point, Brangelina's family had grown quite large. They were raising their son Maddox, whom Angie adopted back in 2002. Three years later, the couple had a daughter, Zahara, from Ethiopia. In 2006, the Jolie Pitt family had a biological daughter, Shiloh, and a year later, a Vietnamese boy named Pham Quang Sang was adopted who was later named Pax. But the external ideal was disrupted by frequent conflicts in the family. According to those close to the couple, Angie and Brad argued literally about everything from politics to what to cook for dinner. The actor was seriously addicted to booze and marijuana, which will later become a serious argument not in his favor. In addition, in 2007, Brad was allegedly spotted in the company of a Sudanese model with whom he had an affair. At least, that's what the magazines wrote. Anyway, fatherhood became an important part of the actor's life, according to him. 
and it had a great influence on him. I feel like the richest man alive since I've become a father. I worry about them all the time. That's the emotional bond and responsibility that sweeps over you when you have a family to look after. I care about them more than I care about myself, which I think is the real definition of love. In interviews, Pitt always warmly speaks about kids. I think, what can I give them? Children are your life. All the attention is on them as it should be, he said. But let's get back to the movies. For Pitt, 2011 was a year of drama. On May 26, the scandalous film The Tree of Life by Terrence Malick was released in the United States. Brad got the role of the strict and domineering father, Mr. O'Brien, who is trying to raise real men in his sons. Can you pass the butter, please? Can you pass the butter, please, sir? Sir. The situation in the family worsens after the death of one of the children. Despite the fact that a huge script was written, the director didn't actually stick to it. Instead, Malik created several quarters of the 1950s and practically let his actors in them. There was no noise and specially installed lights. According to Brad, one guy just walked behind them with a camera and film. Every day, he gave his actors a few notes that were more like a stream of consciousness. It remembers, it was a really free-form, butterfly net kind of way of catching moments, counterintuitive to the way we do things in Hollywood. He doesn't want to do what he calls hammer and tong a scene as it's written. He doesn't want to do more than two takes, and on the second one, he'd often throw in a dog or send in one of the kids, or just do something surprising to change the tenor of the scene. Then he'd laugh and laugh. The role itself was originally intended for Heath Ledger, but after his death, he was replaced by Brad, who had to overcome his role as a charming hero. Everything was complicated by the fact that it was difficult for the young non-actors who played the sons of the main character to take what was happening seriously, because in front of them was a guy from the cinema. I was supposed to be getting on their case and they're laughing, so I had to take the eldest two off the set and say, this is serious, this is what we're here for, and don't come back until you're ready. After that, they stopped looking at me as the guy they'd seen in the movies, the actor recalls. In addition, Brad was accompanied by a family, which at that time had four children and two on the way, and Pitt and Angelina took turns looking after them. They were chased by paparazzi all the time, which added discomfort not only to the family, but also to the closed director. It was terribly, terribly uncomfortable for him, Pitt admits. The originality of the film greatly influenced its implementation. In some cinemas in America, they even refunded money for a ticket if the viewer watched it for less than 20 minutes. It was too unconventional a director's view. An emphasis was on the viewer's own spiritual experience. The creator tried to pass it through the screen of musical and visual perception of complex philosophical issues. The question of the meaning of life, the importance of being loved and appreciated. It was made through his own personal interpretation of the meaning without an obvious attempt to explain to the fans what the director wants to tell us. In general, Malik, the famous hermit and lover of existential questions, never tried to explain the meaning of the Tree of Life. The film received three Oscar nominations, including Best Film. Received the Palme d'Or at the Cannes Film Festival, was included in the list of the best films of all time by Sight & Sound magazine, and join the personal list of top 10 favorite movies of the famous critic Roger Ebert. The second drama of the year was the work of director Bennett Miller, Moneyball, where Pitt also had the main role. He played Billy Bean, the famous manager of the Oakland Athletics baseball team who tries to promote the team no matter what. Brad was given a difficult task to show the life path, the external and internal struggle of the main character for his ideals and goals. He was able to show Bean's battle well on all fronts, as a manager, father, and husband, to convey his feelings and desire to overcome difficulties. Aaron Sorkin described in making this film the, the other day, he said, he said, there are easy films, there are difficult films, then there's 50 feet of crap, then there's Heaven's Gate, then there's us. <laughs> its acting was proclaimed at the time of the film's release almost the best in his entire career, and critics received the movie very positively. The drama earned $110 million and six Oscar nominations, including in the Best Film of the Year category, as well as four Golden Globe nominations. Brad, who was nominated in the category of Best Male Role, was not spared in both nominations.
In 2012, Pitt returned to the criminal theme again and played in the American drama by Andrew Dominic, Killing Them Softly. We can hardly call a project successful. The movie is a gloomy, cynical picture of a life of the American society, adapted from the novel by George Higgins. His character was Jackie, the adjuster of difficult situations and the arbiter of justice related to mafia cases. Brad here is undoubtedly handsome in his leather jacket and comb back hair. You want me to call Dylan for you so you can talk to Dylan and see who I am? But charisma did not help the film. Critics reacted negatively to the director's attempt to tie the idea of the picture to the economic crisis of 2008 and mafia showdowns to global economic problems. What particularly annoyed many was how Dominic arranged the narrative with the help of a striking sound design, in which the words of Barack Obama, George W. Bush, and others buzzed in the background, sometimes only loosely tied to the world of the film. The audience also did not appreciate the picture. CinemaScore interviewed users gave it an A, and the film became one of the 19 films that received such a poor rating. The following year brought more success. The post-apocalyptic action movie World War Z, directed by Mark Forster, based on the novel World War Z by Max Brooks, was released. It got the main role, which he combined with the position of producer of the film. The project was very out of the usual roles of an actor who rarely took part in action movies. Even when it happened, his characters were different from the standard in those action movies where he agreed to play. There is an opinion that Brad and his production company, Plan B Entertainment, took up the film adaptation for purely commercial reasons. According to the plot, he is a former UN employee named Jerry Lane who is trying to save the family in every possible way from the oncoming zombies with incredible strength. The filming was distinguished by its enormous scale. In Scotland, the production company hired 2,000 extras and the number of the filming group was 1,200 people. Just remember those huge decorations. Great attention was paid to every detail, and every detail had to point to the context. In the episode where the dental office was shown, special emphasis was placed on the teeth. Director Mark Forster adds, It's not just about zombies, it's about a global apocalypse that happens to be spread by zombies. I wanted to create a movie that feels real, so audiences feel like this could happen this minute to any one of us. The general premise is that anything can happen in any kind of scenario on any given day. No one is spared. Everyone is susceptible. That's the plotline in the movie, but it's also real life. Pitt argued for his choice of director by saying that his most memorable moments on film were intimate and human. But not everything was rosy, starting with the fact that the script was rewritten several times, ending with a tense relationship between Pitt and Forster, who was not familiar with blockbusters and did not fully understand how he himself saw the result and was confused in decisions. The final product didn't stick to the original source and more resembled a simple action movie starring Brad. The emphasis was placed more on the actions and struggle of the Lane family for survival than on the broader political and social consequences of the total struggle against the extinction of mankind. Pitt himself told Jeff Boucher from EW how he originally imagined World War Z. He saw it as a thoughtful political blockbuster. These elements mostly disappeared during rewriting and reshooting and turned the picture into a road movie, with the addition of a thriller and a horror film. Jerry. Jerry, what? Stay back. Jerry. No, no. The conflict with the local Hungarian police added fuel to the fire. It raided a warehouse with props where the production stored 85 weapons for filming in Budapest. It happened due to the fact that the weapons were not approved by the national government. It turned out that it was combat and fully functional, which led to proceedings. However, the movie was still a commercial success and got mostly positive reviews. It recouped the costs of $190 million, earning $540 million. On October 18th, a historical drama, 12 Years a Slave, directed by Steve McQueen, was released. It became an adaptation of the autobiography of Solomon Northup. There, Northup tells about his difficult fate in which he had to fight for his own freedom as an African-American in the middle of the 19th century. Pitt got a small role of a Canadian worker, Samuel Bass, who helps the main character on the way to this victory. The image of the Bass turned out to be something typical, almost biblical, with conceptual conversations about good and evil. What amused me just then was your concern for my well-being in this heat. When, quite frankly, the condition of your laborers. Condition of my laborers. It is horrid. The hell? It's all wrong. All wrong, Mr. Epps. 
12 years a slave, brought Brad the coveted Oscar statuette, given to him not for acting, but for producing work. Another minor role went to the actor in Ridley Scott's crime thriller, The Counselor. The image of an intermedium between the main character and the drug business became one of the brightest in the picture, but many criticized the actor for deliberate pretentiousness. Life wisdom combined with jokes from snuff films, a cowboy hat, and the look of Master Yoda turned out very ambiguous. They think everybody's hooked into something. You need to think about this, counselor. These people are out 20 mil. You understand how serious this is. However, several articles were subsequently published about the scene where Pitt's hero died. The audience was impressed so much either by a plausible game or by the bloodiness in the details. The counselor was criticized by the audience for the imperfection of the script, for relishing sex, murder, and violence, and for the weak performance of the actors. On film critics' websites, it earned an average rating of 4 out of 10. In 2014, David Ayer's military adventure thriller Fury appeared on the screens, where Pitt got the main role of a staff sergeant named Don Wardaddy Collier. I did. Best job I ever had. The actor took his role so seriously that he literally lived in a tank, like his character, and treated it like a house. This led to one of the conflicts between him and Scott Eastwood, who according to the script had to chew tobacco and spit it in the tank. It would have ended in a fight if the director hadn't intervened. We were driving down the road, I'm in the turret, Shia is at the other turret, and Scott is on the back spitting chewing tobacco. And I'm starting to get pissed off, I'm starting to get hot, because this is our home. He's disrespecting our home, you know? So I said, in the scene with the cameras rolling, you're going to clean that shit up. Shia clocks it, and you have to understand, we've been through several boot camps already. We've been through a lot in this tank. Shia saw it and felt the same. He's disrespecting our home. So Shia had the same reaction I did and started having some words. It looks cool in his role. This is all that can be said about the film. Otherwise, the film is accused of an implausible scenario, poor motivation of the main characters, and deliberate ostentation of the characters. Dozens of movie blunders, even in positive reviews. Brad Pitt is good, of course, he is almost always good, but never quite finds a way of approaching his character that doesn't call to mind his indelible performance as Aldo Rain in Inglorious Bastards. Roger Ebert expressed his opinion. In general, the picture earned $211 million, paid off, and found its fans. But it was already felt that the career of a talented actor was starting to roll into the abyss. The films released in the following years, despite good reviews, could hardly be called loud or super commercial. Brad was starring in the movie By the Sea, created by his wife Angelina Jolie. She acted as a screenwriter and director, and Angelina and Pitt played the main roles. Being the wife of a failed writer is not good enough for pill popping and self pity. Now you need a better reason to destroy yourself. You know my reason. It was their second collaboration with Brad after Mr. and Mrs. Smith, and the last one. The story tells about the complicated relationship of a married couple who left for the island to save their marriage. According to some rumors, it was an attempt to save their own relationship, and later Angie herself confirmed this. During the THR Awards Chatter podcast, she revealed that she considers By the Sea a kind of last-ditch attempt to save her marriage with Pitt, which ended in September of 2016. I wanted us to do some serious work together. I thought it would be a good way for us to communicate. In some ways it was, and in some ways we learned some things. But there was a heaviness, probably during that situation that carried on, and it wasn't because of the film. By the Sea was criticized and only got a little more than $3 million at a cost of $10 million. Despite the beautiful Angelina and the attractive views of Malta, the audience did not like either the plot or its implementation. After that, Adam McKay's biographical drama The Big Short, dedicated to the events of the mortgage financial crisis of 2007 and 2008, was released. The script of the film is based on the book by Michael Lewis, The Big Short, Inside the Doomsday Machine. According to the story, several financial experts predicted the crisis and decided to benefit from it in the real estate market. Pitt became not only the director of the film, but also got a small role to ensure good financing of the production. The image of a retired banker, Ben Rickart, became prominent for the actor against the background of standard roles. Forget about the cuteness, this time he had long hair, an overgrown beard, and glasses. You hardly recognize Pitt right away, passing by the monitor. Bet you still there? 
Yeah. I'll be honest. This gentleman scared the shit out of me. That's a good thing, right? Ricard's prototype is Ben Hockett, who, together with his friends, organized an investment fund and amassed wealth thanks to his bets against the housing market. The director used accessible and sometimes humorous ways to illustrate complex financial instruments and tools, from collateralized debt obligations and tranches to credit default swaps and mortgage-backed securities that helped sink the global economy. This led to an appropriate result. The picture received high rates for the depth and plausibility of the presentation of market and economic mechanisms, which are little accessible to the uninitiated viewer. But also, it got the Oscar for the Best Adapted Screenplay and four more nominations, including for Best Film. In 2016, Pitt was involved in the filming of the promising romantic thriller Allied in duet with the beautiful Marianne Cotillard. The picture by Robert Zemeckis told about the love of a U.S. intelligence agent played by Brad and a Nazi spy. The screenwriter of the film, Stephen Knight, admitted that the idea was invented by him during one of his trips. I was tooling around America some 30 years ago, working in Texas, of all places. Sitting in a backyard, a friend of mine's auntie said that her brother had been a special operations executive, SOE, behind enemy lines during World War II, gotten a French resistor pregnant, and later found out she was a spy and ended up killing her. It hardly looked like a documentary or even a historically plausible film, but Allied aimed to convey the spirit of the time, saturated with contradictory reality. A combination of truth, fiction, the unfathomable fog of war, and two bright actors whose collaboration really made a splash. People thought, did a stormy romance really happen between Pitt and Cotillard? And was it connected with the rumors of the collapse of Brangelina? Unfortunately, we will never know whether there was an affair, but what is known is that Marion taught Pitt French for the role. The audience noticed that both actors were not very comfortable in their roles. They looked strained and clumsy. The aging golden boy has never been comfortable with conventional heroes or handsome stiffs, and here he's both. Robert Abel wrote in one of the articles. If we're dead tomorrow. No one would know. The film received mixed reviews, in which the script and the lack of chemistry between the actors caused criticism. It grossed $119 million, paying off the cost of the film production and received praise for costumes, cinematography, and music. On the other hand, for RogerEbert.com, Peter Sobinski gave the film four stars. Starting with this period, Brad began to appear less in public and in movies. A difficult divorce with Angelina, which will formally end in 2019, but in fact will not end by the time this script is written. Jolie filed for divorce in the fall of 2016, arguing for her decision because of the difference in approaches to parenting and the actor's addiction to alcohol and banned substances. The situation was aggravated by the fact that after the release of the film By the Sea, each of them went into their own lives. Here's what the insider said about it. I could say that the announcement of the divorce was a shock to us, but it's not. They have lived different lives for the past year. Brad was busy with various projects and flew from place to place, and Angelina stayed at home and was raising children. They became further and further apart with each passing month. Friends who watched them from the sidelines predicted an imminent divorce. Despite the attempt to return to the relationship in 2014 and the atmospheric wedding of the actors, everything was falling apart. According to the couple's friends, the wedding itself was organized for the sake of the children and their peace of mind. But according to one of Pitt's relatives, quoting his words, I endlessly lay on the couch, smoke weed, and felt the complete meaninglessness of my life. The passion between the lovers had since faded. Angie's illness, family squabbles, only brought the relationship to an end. But it marked a new round of vision in the actor's life. The vision of his career and his life. Pitt began to treat the roles more selectively, abandoning the position of the external protagonist and focusing on non-standard characters. He devoted a lot of time to his role as a film producer, arguing this area as a way to help the creativity of up-and-coming directors and promote the work of already famous masters. Spending time oftenly in his residence, Pitt began to immerse himself more and more in his inner world and creativity. Out here in California, there's a lot to talk about being your authentic self, it would plague me. What does authentic mean? For me, it was getting to a place of acknowledging those deep scars that we carry. 
It has a number of properties in and outside of LA, a beach house near Santa Barbara, a modernist glass and steel residence also in the Hollywood Hills. But its craftsman home, which has been a fixture in his life throughout his tenure as a movie star, where he's been holed up for much of the pandemic. The house, which is located in Los Feliz, California, was purchased by the actor in 1994 from Cassandra Peterson, known to the public from the movie Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. The actress intrigued Brad by the fact that there were supposedly ghosts living there. It was really run down and dilapidated. It tells, I lived here for a few years and then I bounced around everywhere and just let friends crash here. And then somewhere in the aughts I fixed it up, been pretty much hiding out here. There, the actor was engaged in art and music without considering it as a serious matter. He sculpted ceramic products and played the guitar. I'm one of those creatures that speaks through art, it explains. I just always want to make. If I'm not making, I'm dying in some way. Did you ever have the rock star fantasy? Oh, sure, but I couldn't sing for, you know, shit. And I couldn't play anything, so I had to go to the next best thing. <laughs> Another direction of the actor's creativity was winemaking in their joint estate with Angelina in Province Chateau Miraval. In 2008, they bought with Jolie a plot where world-class rose wine was produced, becoming a multi-million dollar business. And each of them had an equal share in the business. Recently, the estate has been the subject of heated discussion in the media and in court, as the actress sold her part to a Russian entrepreneur without Pitt's knowledge. After the divorce, Pitt stopped drinking and even began to visit the Alcoholics Anonymous group, where he spent a year and a half. I had a really cool men's group here that was really private and selective, so it was safe, he says. Because I'd seen things of other people who had been recorded while they were spilling their guts, and that's just atrocious to me. Now, his main drink is water. In 2017, a comedy thriller by David Michaud called War Machine was released, where Pitt again had the main role of General Glenn McMahon, whose image was taken from a real person, a former serviceman of the U.S. Armed Forces, Stanley McChrystal. And the plot itself has real references to the events of the war in Afghanistan. It is not known whether the picture would have been released if not for Brad and his production company, which took up the project. As a result, a very controversial result came out an exciting, satirical, and sometimes ridiculous black comedy in which the main character seems to make fun of himself or the story as a whole. In any case, it was very unusual for us to see Pitt in such an image. We are here to build, to protect. We are not here to harass, to intimidate. We're not here to shoot first and ask questions later. War Machine received mixed reviews and a fairly small rating an average of 5 out of 10 on film critics' websites. Among the comments there was such things as costly failure of Netflix and Pitt as the wrong choice of the main character. The next role, or rather Brad's cameo, was the image of the Vanisher in Deadpool 2 by David Liech. But he appeared on the screen for only a few seconds at a time when his hero was being electrocuted. What was shooting that like? <laughs> <laughs> uh, pretty much the easiest thing I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> In an interview, Ryan Reynolds said that Pitt set a very unusual condition to agree to the role. I was told all he wants is a cup of coffee, and I said, like a franchise or just one individual cup of coffee? And I was told one individual cup of coffee, which was really his way of saying, I'm doing it for nothing. And it was a total solid and the nicest thing anyone could do. According to him, Brad's consent looked crazy even for them. After all, a star of his scale agreed to the role without words and practically without actions for free. In 2019, Quentin Tarantino's dramatic comedy Once Upon a Time in Hollywood was released. There, the actor got the supporting role of a stuntman named Cliff Booth. Pitt's partner on the set was Leonardo DiCaprio, who played actor Rick Dalton. And just where I am in my life, I, I, I was just really drawn to him. I love what Quentin had written. It was a guy who was pretty at peace with his place in life knew what he was dedicated to, what he was not dedicated to. Initially, Tarantino wrote a book under the same name, but then realized that it turned out to be a screenplay. A screenplay that each viewer regarded in his own way. For some, it became an easy and unobstructive movie, with deep philosophical overtones and classic Tarantino texts. You are real, right? I'm as real as a donut, mother <laughs> It tells about how not to lose face when you are written off and how to accept life as it is. 
All this is demonstrated through the hero of Pitt. The actor's performance was elevated controversially, but for sure everyone remembers the part of the movie with his shirt off. 56-year-old Brad showed that there's juice in the old raisin. However, Pitt is not the kind of actor who likes to get undressed on stage. Quinton told how it happened. Actually, it was fun because Brad is embarrassed to do such things in public. At the same time, he works very clearly. So I go up to him and say, maybe you should gradually unbutton this Hawaiian shirt, then take it off, and then the t-shirt. And he's like, seriously? You want me to go through all this button nonsense? I'll just take it all off in one go. Let's get started. Tarantino admitted that he enjoyed working with the actor. I like that this guy knows what's going on, so fuck off and let the master do his job, he added. But not by sex scenes alone. To prepare for another memorable scene, the fight with Mike Bowe's hero, he specially trained before and after the shooting day. At a specially equipped training ground, he studied martial arts, especially paying attention to Filipino ones. Brad loved getting into the Filipino stick work, recalled veteran fight coordinator Rob Alonzo. But getting a sprain or a fracture during the filming fight scenes wasn't the only risk. Tom Cruise, my friend, will tie himself to a side of an airplane and it will take off and land. I put applesauce on my neck so a pit bull could give me love and affection. I don't, I don't know who's braver. Not all reviews were positive. The movie was accused of a lack of dynamics and tightness and that it radically stood out from all of Tarantino's works. For his work on the film Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Brad Pitt was awarded an Oscar and the Screen Actors Guild Award for Best Supporting Role. Once upon a time in Hollywood, ain't that the truth? This is for my kids who color everything I do. I adore you. Thank you. It is noteworthy that at the screening of the film at the Cannes Film Festival, it was the scene with Pitt undressing that caused genuine delight in the audience. The audience greeted it with a standing ovation and an approving whistle. The second film of 2019 was James Gray's fantasy thriller Ad Astra. In the company of Tommy Lee Jones, he played an astronaut who goes through dangerous trials and cosmic cataclysms to solve the mystery of his father's disappearance. Along the way, you will also ponder about God and the meaning of human life. And of course, you'll enjoy the cosmic beauty. We're both fathers ourselves, and we wanted to do something very sincere and raw and painfully honest, it exclaimed, talking about himself and the hero. That was our jumping off point. Considering how much screen time was spent on the journey of Pitt's hero, it was not surprising to find out that his company was again producing the picture. The whole film is based on Brad and his ability to convey heartache and the search for meaning through an emotionally closed hero. He completely separates himself from the comedic role, plunging into a serious dramatic one. You know, it's this, uh, this Marlboro Man image of don't show weakness. But then we were questioning, you know, in doing that, are we actually denying our own feelings, denying a part of ourselves, a vulnerability in this guise of Superman to really be open for our loved ones, um, for our sons and daughters, in the sense that, that we're all flawed, we're, most of us are doing the best we can. This has been the most challenging film I have ever worked on, it said. Well, it's better to get to see the movie firsthand and draw conclusions for yourself and then decide whether he coped or not. In any case, his work was highly appreciated by the audience. His performance is beautifully restrained, expressing entire continents of emotion with one eyebrow movement, commented some. Brad Pitt is simply phenomenal in this wonderfully poignant and visually exciting James Gray film. Others echoed them. Well, that's it. I mean, we. We go to work, we do our jobs, and then it's over. We're here and then we're gone. Ad Astra got $132 million, paying off production costs and receiving an average rating of 8 out of 10 on film critics' websites. Some authors suggest that the film was a reflection of the actor's inner state for this period. Its recent interviews reveal his desire to become aware of himself and the world around him, to know the divine. In a dialogue with Zach Barron, he says that his attitude to religion was constantly changing. I grew up with Christianity, always questioned it, but it worked out at times. And then when I got on my own, I completely left it and called myself agnostic. Tried a few spiritual things, but didn't really feel right. Then I called myself an atheist for a while, just kind of being rebellious. 
And then I found myself coming back around to just belief and hate to use the word spirituality, but just a belief in what we're all connected, he said. It also often reflects on loneliness. After parting with Angie, the actor never started a new long-term relationship. There were rumors of an affair with Sienna Miller, but both celebrities denied the fact. In 2019, Brad was seen together with Nicole Petrulski several times, but the romance quickly ended. On the WTF with Mark Marin podcast, he jokingly called his personal life a disaster. I always felt very alone in my life. Alone growing up as a kid, alone even out here. And it's really not till recently that I got a greater embrace of my friends and family. What's that line? It was either Reich or Einstein, believe it or not, but it was something about when you can walk with the paradox, when you can carry your real pain and real joy simultaneously, this is maturity, this is growth. A kind of way to cope with the separation and perhaps not to feel lonely was his participation in charity. In 2020, photos of Brad in a red flannel shirt resting after working as a volunteer at Watts Community Corps delivering food to families in need were scattered on the web. Brad worked all the time and was grabbing more boxes than anyone there and then carrying probably six boxes at a time on a cart. Most people never realized they were facing a celebrity. But this was not the first episode of the actor's charity. According to tax data in 2006, Pitt and Angelina Jolie donated more than $8 million to charity. They visited various countries such as Pakistan, Haiti, and went to Africa to involve the public in solving pressing problems. In 2007, he created a non-profit foundation, the Make It Right Foundation, to finance and build homes in New Orleans after the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. In the same year, Pitt and Jolie made a donation to three aid organizations in Chad and Darfur, affected by the crisis in the Darfur region of Sudan. In September of 2009, Pitt received an award from the U.S. Green Building Council in recognition of the green housing concept used for the Make It Right Foundation. In January of 2010, the Jolie Pitt Foundation made a donation to Doctors Without Borders, an international medical humanitarian organization that provides emergency medical care in more than 80 countries. In 2015, Newsweek magazine named Pitt as one of the 15 people who make America great for engaging the public on Africa's issues. After a break, Pitt returned in 2022 with three projects at once. A new stage in the actor's career began. It is felt that he switched again from authors to materials that emphasize his appearance and magnetism. On the other hand, we can see the actor's fatigue from his own fame. Anyway, that's what he says and admits. The weirdest place that you have been recognized, like yes. out in public. Well, the most uncomfortable is certainly at a urinal. If you look at his recent interviews, you can see that he tends to talk with awe about how he grew up in the Ozarks and talks less about his life as a celebrity. Brad willingly poses in suits for $1,000, but at the same time claims that he tries not to put his face on the poster of the film. I think I'm on my last legs. He told author Otessa Moshfeg about his career for the cover of GQ. And in 2019, in an interview, he admitted that with age, his attitude to acting was changing. According to Brad, he still likes acting, but he no longer wants to focus his whole life on this, to live only in his films. In an interview, he said, there was just too much emphasis on finding interesting characters. I went, F me, man, live an interesting life and the rest will take care of itself. At the same time, if you pay attention to the GQ photo shoot itself, we see in picturesque poses and bright costumes that he is still ready for battle and is not going to retire completely. The release of his movies in 2022 is clearly proof of this. On March 12th, the premiere of the adventure comedy The Lost City, directed by Aaron and Adam Nee, happened. The actor once again put on the mask of a comical, brutal, sexy, handsome male with his hair proudly fluttering. Good scene. Phone. Right. He played a CIA agent who saves the main actors. Despite the fact that he appeared in the picture for a short time, it turned out to be impressive. In one of the scenes, we can notice a reference to his long-standing role in Fight Club. At the moment, when Tatum is talking to Brad's character on the phone, like his previous persona, Pitt is chewing something on the other end of the wire at the time of the conversation. Brad agreed to the role of Jack Trainer thanks to the cunning of Sandra Bullock. 
who was not only an actress, but also a producer of the picture. That the Janine Rath Thompson, who's been doing my hair for centuries on films, does his hair. And he asked her to call me and ask me to do him a favor. And then I called her, I go, well, since I said yes, can you get in his ear and ask him to do our film? And he said, yeah. So it literally, that's how it went down. There's nothing sexy about it. It just is perfunctory. It's all about hair. Hair stylists hold all the power in Hollywood. The film received mixed initial reviews. Despite the good humor and a good cast, the picture is scolded for a mediocre script and a poorly thought out antagonist. On average, the picture received 7 out of 10, which is not bad for a modern Hollywood comedy. They also didn't forget about Brad's acting. It is impossible not to mention Brad Pitt, who can definitely be called one of the main advantages of the picture. He got the brightest and really charismatic character who, even if he appears on the screen for at most 5 minutes, steals the whole movie, summed up one of the commentators. The picture paid off, grossing $190 million. The second film of the year with Brad, where he now played the main role, was Bullet Train by David Liech. By the way, it was about the participation in this film that Pitt asked Sandra Bullock as a favor. The film is based on the novel Marie Beetle, written by Kataro Asaka, and judging by the trailer, it turned out to be cheerful. According to the plot, Brad is an assassin who, during a trip on the Japanese Express, cheerfully and humorously kicks his rival's asses. And the actor does it without anyone's help. And people were going a little stir crazy. There was almost a feeling of depression, like a worldwide depression in the air or something. Yeah. Read the script, and it just I, I was I was I laughed out loud like by the time we got to the Bad Bunny scene, and I said, "That's that's 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 the salve we need right now. This is what I want to see." According to stunt director Greg Remener, Pitt performed 95% of his stunts on his own. He delegated the most dangerous moments to his stuntmen, paying attention to the funniest ones. But he also got a good deal for it. According to Variety, the actor's fee was $20 million. The actor explained his approach to filming as follows. This was action comedy, in, in something I had never done before. Dave and I had always been big fans of Jackie Chan. We've been talking about him for decades, uh, like just like he's our Buster Keaton. He's so talented and underrated even. The press vividly discussed the spectacular appearance of the actor in a linen skirt during the premiere of the film in Berlin. Whether it was an attempt to prove that the actor is keeping up with fashion trends or a way to attract attention, we don't know. But Brad explained the act like this. I don't know, we're all going to die, so let's mess it up. In Los Angeles, he was no less bright, which of course pleases us. It means that despite the lawsuits with Angelina and a difficult period, he does not lose his positive mindset. Even despite the fact that Bullet Train was received ambiguously, The Guardian described it as strangely tedious and extremely unfunny. Reviewing it for The Telegraph, Robbie Collin was even less impressed, awarding it only one star. One particularly bad scene, both critics pointed out, sees Pitt end a comic monologue by inviting the viewer to insert, I don't know, something witty, themselves. The 58-year-old Pitt, Collin stressed, was badly miscast as the movie's motor-mouthing smartass leading man. The third project of 2022 was Damien Chazelle's Babylon. The film tells about the behind the scenes of filmmaking, the ups and downs of the actors, the difficult filming process, the transition from silent films to sound ones, and many others. Chazelle, as one of Hollywood's greatest romantics, glorifies the cinematographic art and the impact it has on people while at the same time showing another dirty, cynical, and cruel side of the film business. Brad plays the role of an aging actor in the film who is very popular in the past. The actor has been following Chazelle's work for a very long time, and when he read the director's new script, he called it a masterpiece and immediately agreed to the role. Unfortunately, Babylon failed at the box office. Critics in turn were divided into two camps. Some were delighted with the story and the acting, Others criticized the film for its overloaded plot and idolization of everything vicious that was once in old Hollywood. Nevertheless, Babylon received five Golden Globe nominations, among which one was for Brad, nine nominations for Critics' Choice Awards, and three BAFTA and Oscar nominations. The actor's personal life is still the subject of furious discussions. On the one hand, there are rumors of a renewed affair with Aniston. So fans were surprised to learn about the correspondence of his ex-wife in 2017. 
Brad told her that he was having a hard time because of the breakup, and they exchanged several messages remembering the past. Marie Claire reports, and after parting with her second husband, Aniston invited the actor to her parties several times in 2019. In 2020, the former spouses behaved clearly ambiguously, clearly flirting with each other. Hi, Brad. You know how cute I always thought you were. I think you're so sexy. Will you come to me? Despite this, both actors claim that they are just friends. On the other hand, there is Angelina and the lawsuits around the collapsed marriage. The former love is furiously trying to ensure that Brad does not have access to their common children. It's interesting how the actor himself treats the situation and their past with a bit of humor. During his acceptance speech for his role in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, at the SAG Awards ceremony, he decided to joke about their relationship with Angelina. I played a guy who gets high, takes his shirt off, and doesn't get on with his wife. It was a big stretch, he joked on stage. At this time, Jen, who was sitting in the hall, clearly appreciated the joke, laughing at his comments. But was it really that bad? What was the real relationship between Mr. and Mrs. Smith? What secrets do their marriage keep? Click on the link and go to watch our video with a full history of Brangelina's relationship. That's all we wanted to tell you about Brad Pitt's life. Like this video and subscribe to the channel so as to not miss the most interesting biographies. There was a biographer with you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.